My name is Gail Asuli. I'm the founder of Creative Caucasus. Our organization uh, supports, among other things, uh, creative and uh, cultural industries in the region. Uh, today we have a real treat uh, to have a guest who I'm going to introduce shortly and also cover a very interesting subject topic. As you are all aware, for the last couple of months, we've been tied to our homes uh, because of the coronavirus. I know that things are opening a little bit. Uh, in Georgia, for example, the public transportation is starting today. But uh, there are a lot of things that are not open and a lot of people, especially in our industries, are kind of anxious. And today's workshop is actually going to address this issue, anxiety and crisis. And if there is one person who can do it so well, it's uh, our friend and colleague from Estonia, Ragnar Seel, uh, who is the founder of Creativity Lab. Many of you probably know Ragnar from his trip to our region. I'm sure he's been uh, to Georgia, Armenia, and uh, Azerbaijan combined uh, maybe 50 times. And uh, he's been uh, holding all kinds of position in the European Union as a chairman of uh, Creative Industries Development Forum and under secretary of Estonian Ministry of Culture. I know several events that Ragnar initiated in Estonia, some of you might know Tallinn Music Week and many, many other things that uh, he's well known for in this field. So without further ado, I will ask our friend Ragnar, Ragnar Sil to start the workshop. Thank you, Ragnar. Hi, everyone. This is Tallinn calling. Hi, Lana. Good to see some of you. Your microphone is off, so... Um. Sorry, sorry, good to see you and hope you all are safe and well and really happy to see you all here. We are going to spend a, a, a bit less than two hours together on, uh, uh, on a topic which is so uh, actual, as, as Gela mentioned, uh, crisis, uncertainty, uh, and what to do in the times when, uh, when uh, um, the world around us, as we know it, seems to be crumbling. I, uh, I would actually, I, I know that most of you, you work, uh, um, you work uh, in the cultural creative sector. So if you uh, take this moment and uh, open up your chat, and if you could just quickly write to your chat, uh, 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 what, uh, what is exactly your uh, um, uh, field of, uh, of uh, operations? Are you in museums, in mu music, festival organization? Uh, maybe you can share. Uh, what is your background? Just quickly uh, in the chat. Just to understand what are the kind of sectors that we are covering here. Museums, okay. Very good. We are going to talk about museums. Choreography, dancer, interesting. Theater oh, from Armenia, fantastic. Uh, festivals, anything else? Creative startups, yeah, so entrepreneurship. Anything else? Okay. So, uh, art studio. So we, uh, we have a, and you can keep on writing, so I'm, I'm gonna see it uh, from, uh, from my screen. Um, and as Kiela was mentioning, uh, uh, the, the current crisis has really hit uh, culture very hard, uh, not only in your country, but across the world. And that's probably something that is very different with this crisis compared with many other crises because it seems that we are all in this uh, together. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, things are uh, slightly different. I know that uh, during the, the medical phase of the, the crisis, Georgia was actually doing uh, uh, quite well. Um, I've read, uh, read now some news from Armenia, and I know that uh, 
there are some difficulties there. Uh, in Estonia, we were also closed down, uh, as most of the countries. But then when you talk with uh, colleagues from uh, Barcelona, for example, then after talking to them, you, uh, you cannot say that it was uh, uh, really a lockdown or a guarantee. Um, we have uh, been able to go out uh, more than we have ever done in our lives. I've probably walked uh, more than ever in my life. Um, on average, 10 kilometers a day uh, here in Tallinn, I'm living next to the sea, next to the forest, taking out my child uh, with family. But then uh, my colleagues in Barcelona had not been out. The, the children and the family had not stepped out of their apartment for 52 days. So I, I think it is very different uh, in terms of how uh, severe the crisis actually uh, is. Now, um, just to make a, a, a little introduction, we are going to talk about today about not just about this, this uh, crisis as such. I mean, um, there is not much we can do about this particular crisis, COVID-19, but we are going to talk about uh, what it takes for organizations, art organizations, including to be more sustainable and to be more resilient in these times of crisis. And I already can say in the beginning that basically we can divide this talk into two parts, on, on two the, the messages we can turn into two parts. The first message that I'm going to go through uh, uh, throughout my, uh, my um, uh, workshop with you is that uh, those that were very well prepared are doing better than those that were not. So it's more like a hindsight. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, we are going to talk about some of the things if you have, if you were not prepared for anything and you find yourself now in this very difficult situation, what can we possibly do? Okay, so these are the kind of things. Now, I would also like you all to uh, send me questions if you have them uh, as we go along. We are going to do some polls. We are going to do some uh, breakup rooms as well, so you can have a, a chat, but I would like you to ask me directly questions, either by showing hand uh, uh, here in Zoom, raising your hand uh, and waving, or uh, uh, writing your question to the chat. Um, as some of you know me, but as Kela mentioned, I, uh, my background actually is in, in, uh, in government. So I worked uh, for almost 10 years in the Ministry of Culture. I, have, uh, I was responsible for setting up the Estonian culture policy. I was setting up the Estonian ecosystem for the creative industries. After those 10 years, uh, I worked uh, three years for the European Union Eastern Partnership. So uh, that's why some of you know me. I was working uh, in Ukraine, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, Belarus, and Georgia. Uh, mostly, I think I, I spent most time in Georgia. So I, I've been there probably around, yeah, 15 times or so. But I also worked with Armenia and Azerbaijan. I've been there in both countries, maybe five, six, seven times. And actually, uh, this summer, uh, um, uh, I, I, um, last year uh, in September, uh, I planned a big uh, a trip uh, with my friends, uh, lots of my friends, to Georgia. So we went there. And this uh, summer, we planned a trip to Armenia. So uh, uh, it is cancelled now, but uh, that's how much I love all of your countries. Um, uh, we uh, worked uh, on several levels, so we worked on trainings, so we worked on awareness raising, we helped uh, on uh, uh, preparing uh, creative industries reports based on UNESCO um, uh, cultural indicators. Uh, we have also uh, prepared uh, uh, a manual on how to develop uh, uh, culture creative industries and, and, and cultural strategy in small, uh, smaller cities and regions. Um, we worked uh, in uh, places like Sisian, 
in, uh, in Armenia, we worked in Shamkir uh, in uh, uh, Azerbaijan, and we worked in uh, Mshketa region uh, uh, in, um, uh, in Georgia. So uh, if you want uh, us to discuss a bit more in the situations in your countries, please uh, 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 feel free uh, uh, to discuss or ask those uh, questions to me as well. Um, it is clear that the world uh, is a very unpredictable place at the moment. It's very clear. Um, but what is interesting is that the changes that we see now, uh, or the, 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 the crisis itself, the, the concept of the crisis, should not be a surprise. Uh, the world goes, uh, as you know, in, in uh, cycles. Uh, crises come and they go. Um, if you think about it in economic terms and, and with the, uh, the medical crisis, with the COVID crisis, we are, go we are talking also about long, uh, a medium and long-term economic crisis that will hit in terms of tourism, in terms of unemployment, etc. And, and that shouldn't become as a surprise. Let's remember that the last crisis was um, around 10 years ago, 2008, 2009, 2010. The, the growth cycle started in 2011. Uh, just in the last couple of years, the stock markets globally have shown unprecedented growth. That's something that uh, Donald Trump was uh, hoping uh, uh, that takes him to the next presidency. So actually, the discussion of the bubble uh, has been uh, ongoing for the couple of last years, the real estate bubble, the uh, stock bubble, um, and it was just a matter of, of, uh, of timing. Now, when does it come and what exactly causes the, uh, the problem? So uh, also, we have been going through um, uh, issues uh, related to uh, uh, demographic changes. We've been going through issues related to security, uh, uh, also climate crisis, climate change, naturally. So, and of course, digital revolution. So we, the, 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 digital, the digital transformation and its impact also profoundly for the culture creative sectors have been uh, ongoing anyway. So my, my question that we are going to discuss in the, uh, uh, in the beginning are going to be how ready are we, or how much are we actually paying attention to the changing world around us. And how much, for example, then, if you have been paying attention, uh, the current cri crisis comes as a surprise, or at least how much it, uh, it should influence us uh, in terms of our readiness to take new agile approaches to overcome some of those uh, issues. Now, maybe it sounds harsh, but my view is that the way that the crisis impacts uh, culture creative organizations is very similar to how the crisis, the, the COVID virus impacts people. Uh, the same as, you know, who is the most vulnerable people in the crisis? It's the older, it's the sick people, it's basically people with pre-existing uh, pre conditions. The same with culture organizations or companies there, uh, culture or any company. If you went into the crisis already weak, if you didn't have uh, 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 resources, if you didn't have reserves, if you lacked clear strategy and readiness and skill set, you are very unlikely to come out of this crisis without heavy toll for your operation. It's very, very difficult. However, if you were prepared, then you are in a much better position to come out of this, uh, this crisis. So let me firstly uh, to, uh, say that I think that the first key um, element uh, of, uh, uh, of understanding the impact of the crisis is the importance of strategy. So let me ask you the first question. So I would like to ask uh, Tamu to put up the, the first poll um, and share it with everyone. Can we see this on the screen? Poll number one. 
So do we see the poll number one? No, we can. No, no, no. I, I can't either. But I'm. Uh, is our host there? Yes, but there's some problem. I will fix it right now. Okay. Okay. Anyway, then we move on. Uh, no problem. Uh, the question is, uh, and you can because I see all of you. You can quickly. We can. Uh, uh, you can just open your microphones, all of you, or we can all all open it for you, and you can just. I unmute it all. So now you're all unmuted and the question is uh do you your organization do you have a strategy before going to this crisis or not did you have a strategy or not yes or no 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 Okay, so you see, that's uh, that's something we work uh, uh, we work uh, uh, daily with. Uh, my job is to work with uh, with museums um, uh, and organizations um, and um, uh, help them to be prepared uh, in the level of strategy. Now, uh, it's actually a tricky question: Do you have a strategy or not? We have a little. Yes. So we have a little. Uh, this was a tricky question because some of the strategies, especially in institutions, are those that are just written for the paper. Yeah. Just for. Uh, and they, we will never use them. No? So when I ask actually about strategy, I actually ask about good, valuable working strategy. Uh, we have a problem here with the noise, yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, Ragnar, uh, only, your, uh, only your microphone is activated, so I think it's... Uh, no, somebody else is. Anni Davarashvili's is also activated, no? So let me try again. Does it work now better? No. no. There is some sort of a noise uh, coming from somewhere. No, it's better. We will, we will fix it. Okay, do you hear me? No, but it still makes the noise. Right. So let's try once again. Do you hear me now? It's working right, now. Good. Okay. And no, uh, no noise uh, probably. Uh, okay. So good strategy. Uh, uh, that's something that uh, some of the um, uh, organizations uh, uh, that are doing very well, they have. And some of them that do not, they do not have. We are going to talk about this and I'm going to bring some examples as well. Another thing that is very important at this moment related to strategy is uh, to understand uh, what, what does actually the word sustainability mean in terms of organizational sustainability? What is it? Okay, Because when we use sus the word sustainability, sustainable organizations, we usually tend to take one of two approaches. Some people think that when we talk about sustainability, we mean uh, financial sustainability. I am financially sustainable. I have money in a long term, okay? Uh, or I have a very uh, good uh, income uh, streams, revenue streams coming in. On the other hand, 
people think to, uh, tend to think about sustainability as something connected with the environment, something the corporate social responsibility, uh, ecological footprint, etc., which is also uh, true. Uh, when we talk about sustainability in terms of organizational sustainability, and which is so incredibly important at this very moment uh, uh, during the crisis, it's actually much more complex issue uh, than just financial or, or environmental. It is actually all about looking to the future. Okay, that's the link with the strategy. Being sustainable or running your organization sustainably means that you understand the changing environment around you and that you plan your activities, not just looking at the short-term impact, but also the long-term impact of your activities. So that is very, very important. If you are, have no strategy, it's very difficult to imagine how are you able to run your organization uh, sustainably without having this long-term vision in front of you. Uh, sustainable growth, uh, by if you look at the theory, sustainable growth actually um, includes or, or engages both sides. So it, it is about having a business model or operational model that creates value which is consistent. Okay, so it's not short term, it's not just grabbing whatever I can short term, but actually building a long term relationship. The same with you. I mean, you know who work every day with uh, audiences. I mean, you could you could have what something big today. Okay, not today, of course. Now it's closed, but you know you can have something short term. You can get as much money out of those people. You can, but if you if you fail them, they will not gonna come back. So you're gonna lose the long term uh, uh, benefit for building a a sustainable relationship with your clients, your customers, or your audiences. Bourdieu and Ramstad, 2005, in, in, and, and I'm, I'm happy to share the, the links with you uh, um, later, are basically saying that sustainable organization or the sustainable growth means that you achieve success today, so you have in place successful models, without compromising the needs of the future. So basically like a purest victory. It's both financially important. So you, are, you don't grab everything in short term and, and waste everything now without thinking of a long-term impact. But also it means a human capital. So you don't take maximum out of your people. You don't squeeze them like, you know, sponges but then you need to work them over long term. So you build up that skill, uh, skill set in your organization. At this very moment, uh, uh, and I would like to refer to Philip Kern, and many of you know Philip Kern from KIA International European Affairs, uh, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, think tanks and consultancies in Europe in terms of culture creative sectors. And in my uh, recent interview with Philip Kern, he, he, he put it very well. He said, we are living in times at the moment where, uh, where uh, uh, politicians like to divide the society or the world into two categories, into essentials and non-essentials. And it is our role as cultural managers, cultural leaders, to very clearly remind them that culture is also part of that essentials part. And I don't think that it's very clear. And this is why we come back to the very big issue in good times, now it's too late, but in good times, to understand and to highlight the wider impact of culture. We as culture professionals, we like to believe that everybody understand the role of culture without words, that it is clear, you know, it's, it's, it, it's intrinsically understandable, you know? Why do we have to convince them? I mean, if they're educated people, they understand that culture is important, but that's not the case. That's not the case. So we as cultural managers, I think even now during this crisis, we need to kind of get away from still that stigma that, that thinking about wider impact of culture is somehow instrumentalizing 
uh, uh, culture. Um, now, if you look at the recent years, I think one aspect of the wider impact has been quite clear, and that is the economic impact. I think we all have been talking about economic impact, the jobs, the growth, the innovation of culture sectors. We, with Lana, uh, uh, in our uh, um, uh, seminars uh, for museum sector, have been talking about museums and creative industries. Yeah? So more and more we talk about that. But now in this crisis, we need to talk about it even more wider, uh, wider sense. The, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the cultural impact on, uh, uh, let's say, education, in terms of a, a cultural impact on environmental awareness, social inclusion, building tolerance and trust in rehabilitation, in healthcare, and overall well being. There has been now people and some uh, preliminary reports saying, in the times of social distancing, when people are pushed into their uh, living rooms uh, uh, and the only window to the world is the Zoom, uh, Zoom window, culture is, is one of the few things that keeps us sane, keeps us alive, keeps us still connected to, to something bigger, gives us meaning. Just imagine, somebody said in the interview very well, just imagine the world of quarantine that we just seen. Just imagine millions, hundreds of millions of people being locked down in their rooms and now take away the books, take away the Netflix, take away the radio, take away the music, just take it away. You would see worldwide revolution, you would see anarchy. Yeah? So it is the culture that gives us this sense of, of uh, not only belonging, but sense of comfort. And if in that time the government thinks that it's a smart idea to start cutting the sector, which is one of the worst hits anyway, that's just stupid. Okay? And this is our role to remind uh, people uh, uh, that. One of the good uh, uh, starting points is of course the UN sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. Just look at those sustainable development goals and think of how we in, uh, uh, in the cultural institutions can be useful, can be instrumental in, 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 uh, uh, in solving or helping to solve some of those, uh, so, uh, those issues. But anyway, let's go more in detail uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the tools we can use. Now, I've done uh, probably around 100 strategies in my life or helped to do 100 strategies, around maybe 40 strategies for museums, uh, also around 20 in music, in operas, in, in uh, uh, symphonies, in galleries, in theaters, and all of that also in, uh, in businesses, but, but let's focus on uh, cultural creative uh, 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 sectors. Uh, and uh, what, what is my, my, what is my uh, take on this? Well, firstly, I think that if you ask right questions and if you create a good environment for strategy making process, I think people love strategizing. I think people enjoy thinking about the future. They are actually very good in visioning, to think about their role in the future. I think they are brilliant in that. I think they like to think big. But at the same time, there are things that they don't enjoy, in my experience. One of the things they don't really enjoy is uh, 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 an analyzing the environment where they work, and thinking about uh, and predicting the future. And for that future that might bring some of the uh, risky elements, they don't take seriously risk analysis. I have not yet seen an organization that puts really an effort for risk management, risk analysis and risk mitigation. I don't see this. It's something that you have to have. A project that uh, asked you to, you, you kind of fill it in quickly, but you don't, uh, an average, I mean, all of you said you don't have really an, a strategy, but you definitely don't have a risk plan, okay? Uh, or at least 99% of the organization don't. Uh, and that is where we are now, yeah? 
Now when the, the world suddenly, there was an earthquake, uh, uh, they, people are like uh, completely taken by surprise. Again, I just wanted to remind you, I don't think that anyone could have predicted that in 2020, in January, February, March, the world will be closed down because of uh, a, a virus. I, I, I'm not saying this, but I'm saying that it should not be too much of a surprise that around this time, there might be a very, very impactful economic crisis. Maybe because of the collapse of the stock markets, maybe because of uh, something else, but the long-term economic impact should have not become a, a surprise. So, of course, you have lots of tools to work on. Uh, some of you know, uh, some of you are aware of, for example, tools related to, let's say, uh, uh, outside uh, 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 environment analysis. PESTLA is one of the most known. You probably all know this, but I don't know how much you use this. PESTLA, meaning that you analyze the environment and what, what could come in terms of P, meaning political changes, in terms of uh, uh, E, uh, economic, uh, uh, in terms of uh, S, social, demographic, uh, in terms of T, technolo technological changes, in terms of legal or environmental. So political, economic, social, demographic, technological, legal, environmental. And you kind of take them one by one and ask these questions. What could go wrong? What could happen? What is the desirable and less desirable future? What can I do to be better prepared? They are also extremely good, extremely good uh, 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 materials available for all of you. doesn't matter if you come from these sectors or not. Uh, two of my favorites is one is the American Alliance of Museums Trendwatch. Lana, you know this very well. The Trend Watch that is every year published, they're all for free. I'm going to send you the link. And you basically, you can come from whatever sector, even music. You take that and look at how, we, how can we adapt to these trends that happen, these either mega trends or trends specific for my sector. But then also, uh, one of my absolute favorites is comes from libraries, uh, library uh, sector. Uh, library of the future, again from US, but doesn't matter. Library of future trends. How many of you have ever heard of that? Any of you? No? Those that I see the faces are not uh, saying no. Uh, you have. So I will share my screen quickly to go to their website and let's just look at what I mean. Fantastic uh, uh, research, uh, resource. So if you go, now let me open. You see it now. Yeah, this is a library of the future website. There are some trends. They even have updated the trends for the coronavirus pandemic. So even up to date. But if you look at this, these are the trends and there are lots of them as you can see. They are in different uh, uh, categories. They are society, uh, technology, education, environment, politics, economics, demographics. So they are very different. This is fantastic uh, uh, resource. When we work with museums or libraries or music organizations, we often take those as examples. Now, if you open some of those, for example, we have often talked about uh, uh, big data. How will big data in the future changes the way we work as organizations? Data everywhere. You open it and what happens? It actually describes the background, gives links, shows how this trend has been developing, but also gives some of the pointers of how this matters for uh, libraries. This is something that you can then use for each of your sectors, from museums or, or for others, but how this actually can uh, uh, practically uh, uh, influence the way you work. Um, I'm going to close this one just quickly because there are many 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 of those very good tools they could be for example in terms of uh, 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 gamification how people's uh, willingness to uh, uh, to use new technologies in more playful way could give you pointers in cultural organizations how you could uh, uh, come up with new uh, new services 
uh, or uh, uh, engage with your audiences in different ways, for example, or in terms of data privacy, so intellectual, uh, the, the privacy of the data and how this influences our work, or drones or micro mobility, or the way that people consume culture differently, the short span, attention span. We know that people are now with a shorter attention span than ever before. Yeah. So these are the kind, like for example, reading. People often say that people read so little nowadays. This is absolutely wrong. People today read more than they have ever read in their lives. It's just that they read very differently very very differently they the methods they read the way they read they read shorter text etc the, the different uh, tools and mediums they read but they read they read and they create they write more than ever before in uh, in different tools so how this all will change the way we work so this is a very very good uh, uh, tool uh, now it's uh, the second one that i mentioned is risk okay so it's not just that you think of the future and think of how different things might happen and is there going to be a crisis or not, or is there going to be virus or not, or is there going to be political turmoil, or is there going to be a, ba a next bad uh, uh, crisis with Russia and, uh, and the borders closed and no, no tourists come. I mean, again, the world is shocked because tourism is now going to be impacted. But I think... For example, Georgia is in a better, should be in a better position to be ready for thinking of what can organizations that rely on tourism do, because you have gone through several examples of your big neighbor closing down all the borders and the uh, uh, airlines and uh, dropping tourism. So how you can how can you re readjust your value proposition? Hi, Damta, good to see you as well. So again, risk analysis. People simply don't take risk analysis seriously. We work with organizations and we want them to go deep in risk. One of the things that people do wrong with risk is how we assess them. Okay, so that's one, one big thing. Again, I quickly share my, uh, uh, my uh, 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 screen, if you allow me, just to show you. So what we often do with risks is, uh, is that we make this kind of an assessment. You all know this, you're all aware of this. You basically uh, uh, look at one, on one uh, axis, you look at the probability, how likely it is that this happens, this risk, and then you, uh, it's impact. And you ask yourself uh, how impactful, how much it will impact me if it happens. And often you simply use this simple one, two, three model. So you say one, it's not likely or not impactful, two, medium, three, very, and then you may just uh, uh, make a simple calculation. So if there is something that uh, uh, is very impactful and very probable, it's three times three is a nine, and if it's very unlikely and not uh, uh, impactful, it is one times one is one, and you make this kind of a list and you kind of understand which are the risks that might impact me most. Now, one of the problem with that kind of a, a, a risk assessment is, and we see this now with this uh, crisis, is that this very simple mathematics um, uh, uh, approaches the risk uh, equally. Meaning that if you use one to three like this, basically a risk that is extremely unlikely to happen but if happens has extremely high impact. So very, very unlikely to happen, one, but very, very big risk uh, if it happens on me, three, one times three gives you three, okay? But on the opposite side, if there is a probability, uh, some, a risk that is extremely likely to happen, but it has a very, very low impact, it's also three. So you can equally look at two risks, equal risk, something that is extremely unlikely to happen, but lo low impact, or very, very low uh, probability to happen, but high impact. That's not right. Because now, as we know from this crisis, if something is very, very, very likely to happen, but has extremely low impact on us, is not very important. 
So it is clear that you need to give more, uh, more uh, uh, a role, more game, a more importance to the impact, not the probability. One of the ways to do this is to actually double the points for the impact. So for example, the crisis. It is clear that the virus, the global pandemic, just a year ago, if you think about this, could have been very, 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 very unlikely thing to happen. So you give, you, if you give it one, yeah? But if it happens, and if it means that we need to close everything down, it basically changes everything we know about our sector. So it is not three, it is like 33, it's like 103, yeah? So you need to deal with that kind of a risk much, much more seriously than something that is, it's probably gonna happen, uh, but it's, you know, we, it's, it's not gonna be very, uh, very uh, difficult. So that's, that's the second kind of thing, how seriously we take risk, and this is just the analysis part of the risk. That's just half the work. Uh, do you have a clear um, uh, a mitigation or contingency plan? Do you have a plan? What do you do to lower the probability or lower the impact or control the impact if it happens? Do you have a plan in place? If the answer is no, then uh, risk analysis is useless, okay? So that's, that's the second big thing about being strategic in times of crisis. And thirdly, something that I actually wanted to ask you, maybe uh, what we can do now is uh, we can have our second poll. Let's try, uh, Tamu. Maybe we can have our second poll. Yes. Uh, we have a second question now. The first one is uh, we already done. Have you ever mapped scenarios, different scenarios, for your sector or your, for your organization? So yes, not only mapped those scenarios, but also with the action plan. Second option, yes, we mapped them, but we haven't had an action plan. And third, no, we have not mapped uh, 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 scenarios, future scenarios. So let's just focus on the second question now. Have you mapped? future scenarios for your organization or for your sector? Mm -hmm. As you can see, uh, 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 those people here that have actually mapped together with a plan, which is the only logic, well, why do you map if you don't have a plan? I mean, why? It's just a nice exercise that somebody did during the uh, workshop. That's pointless. You, you, map, you map because you want to use it as a, as a, as a tool. And you see that there's just one person that has uh, said yes. Uh, the rest have either done this exercise without an action plan or haven't done this at all. So uh, that's uh, what we uh, uh, have. Let me just share the results with you as well, so you can see. Um, um, not surprising uh, result, but that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the situation. So I wanted to uh, thirdly uh, talk about uh, quickly the scenario building. Very, very good tool, very important tool. You, building scenarios uh, is a method. I don't know, uh, some of you probably have never done this. Some of you have at least seen it. Uh, and this can be very powerful, why? Because unlike uh, uh, thinking about the future, just thinking about the future, what, you, what, we are te what we tend to do is that we tend to predict future. We predict future. There's two problems with this. Firstly, we don't know how to predict future, okay? But secondly, we, when we predict future, we are actually very subjective. For example, when we worked uh, with uh, libraries and we wanted to understand the role of technology in the way libraries are consumed in the future. So in other words, what is, how will eBooks change libraries? And we talked about some years ago. 
library people that we talked about this hated hated the uh, uh, ebooks. You know, they said no, no, no. Ebooks are not the future. Ebooks, you know, we, I want to uh, smell the smell the book and all of that. Okay. Now, uh, and and when we tried to analyze what could we do in terms of ebook, they were they were very closed because they didn't like it. They they didn't like the idea that ebooks take over the real books. Scenario building and future studies, so that, for example, those trends that I, I, I talked to you about, is a, is a very good tool because you don't talk about tomorrow. You don't talk about the three days or one year or even two five, or five years. You talk about things that might change drastically your environment in 10 years or 20 years to come. That's the, that's the future trends analysis logic. Now, if I ask you to think about something that might happen in 20 years, well, some of, you are, some of them are not alive. Some of them are not definitely working in that sector anymore. Some of them are pensioners. So you are less stuck with it yourself. You, you, are, you, you have more distance to analyze it more objectively, okay? Secondly, uh, we are jumping some, so when we talk about technological change to our sector, Probably in 20 years, we don't talk about e-books. Probably it's something else. So it's not anymore so much tangible thing that we love or hate. It's more about the, the way where we are going. Now, uh, building scenarios is fantastic because instead of predicting future, you actually study different futures. You study different possible ways it might go. And that is very, very, uh, 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 very interesting. Because in all of the, the, the reality might come from, from the mixture of different paths. Uh, very quickly to, to show how it works for those that haven't ever done this. Uh, let me just quickly share again so you can see. So, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I had the wrong. So, scenario development process uh, is that you basically, uh, 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 you map uh, driving forces for your sector. They might be digitalization, it might be uh, data, it might be uh, demographics, it might be, so you have many, many uh, forces that, that, that are important in the way you understand your sectoral development. You then uh, identify critical uncertainties. You basically made a, 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 an axis or you made a, a, a systematic approach. And then you develop scenarios in all of those cases, okay? And that's not just, that's when the exercise ends for some time, but actually that's useless. What you do then is that you actually think, because some of those four corners, as you can see, some of them are very nice and some of them are not nice. So some of them are desirable. You want to move to that direction. Some of them are not so desirable. So what you need to do then is to have a plan, an action plan for desirable scenario to fulfill or to move to the desirable scenario. And also the plan to mitigate when the world goes to the undesirable scenario. What would you do then? Where, what, would you, what would be your value proposition? What would you offer? What would your services be if the world would be like this? Okay? Uh, so th this is basically uh, it. Uh, uh, Lana probably uh, uh, knows this, but this is a very, very strange reading. If you uh, Google, you find uh, uh, a workshop, a material of a workshop done in 2012, summer 2012. It was a beginning of a new uh, economic growth cycle. And it is done, if I'm not mistaken, in the US. Uh, uh, and it's called the Museum Crisis Model uh, Scenario Workshop. And then it, it is a PDF, so it's, it's great. You can read it. It tells you step by step how, uh, uh, how museums in that workshop developed uh, uh, scenarios. And they come up with three scenarios. And one, it doesn't matter what they are, they are better and worse. But one of the scenarios is uh, called distributive crisis. 
And it basically, again, you're 2012, you, you, you start to talk about, okay, the role of technology, they, they, they describe this, like the role of technology is changing, people want more individualized uh, experience, that's true, yes, I think we are agree. Then it also says that there's a movement, especially coming out of the crisis, for, uh, for more business model approach in, uh, in the uh, museum sector, that museums are run more and more as uh, businesses, which has its own threats. Then it basically gets to the 2019, saying that it peaks to the more, eff like a more efficiency, uh, more, uh, more corporate thinking in museums up to the point that, uh, that the educational and scientific activities are getting uh, putting, put, being put in a background. And then what it writes, and it's, it's really, I mean, there was a, during this crisis, there was this fake news. Uh, uh, probably you heard of this, uh, this uh, 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 in Facebook, it went down probably month, two months ago, this uh, uh, page from a book which said that, uh, written in, I don't know, 10 years ago, that, uh, uh, that uh, the crisis is uh, is a man-made and uh, the COVID crisis and you know it predicted exactly what happens and it became out it's a fake you know it, it's there is no book like this it is just written now so if you read this it looks like a fake news it's like somebody written it today and it looks like they put just a no it is real so they write there that in that crisis they get to the big crisis in 2020. Uh, it, they talk about the economic crisis, that it's basically a collapse. They say that it is also because of other crises in the society. They don't use the word virus because who could know the virus, but they do talk about environmental crisis and other crises. And they basically describe a situation like now, basic collapse. Okay. Very strange reading. Oh, I'm saying it's not about predicting. It's basically drawing step-by-step -step ideas of where could our uh, sector go. Now, I'm going to make a kind of a, a stop uh, here by this first strategic point, understanding the landscape. I just want to bring you an example. Uh, uh, and then I have a little break for you and a, a, a breakout room as well. Now, let me bring you an example from libraries, if you allow me. And this is Talent Technical Library. I mentioned you that those that were better prepared on the day one are better prepared to tackle the crisis than those that were not, okay? Now, museums, sorry, the libraries, different libraries, you have those that are more innovative and you have those that are less innovative. There are many that, uh, that uh, uh, are fighting with all technological revolution, etc. Tallinn uh, Tallin, uh, uh, um, Central Library is very different. Tallinn Central Library is, first of all, very well run. When I asked the director about this, uh, she, I mean, she's been there quite a long time, but she says that her main asset uh, is that she has put uh, or she has hired a, a team of young uh, uh, developers, like uh, not the IT developers, but young development team. And she has given them all the freedom to develop new uh, uh, services and digital solutions, okay? Digi becoming digital and becoming agile is part of their existing strategy. Already now, Estonian government doesn't have a central system, a system for libraries for ebook, uh, uh, ebook uh, 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 lending. It, it, there is no such a thing. So Tallinn Central Library, instead of just waiting when the government does it, and most, I mean, 99% of the libraries do not have that, they did it on their own. They developed on, with their own finances. They developed some years ago their own uh, ebook learning uh, uh, ebook uh, uh, lending system uh, it was not there was not too many people there but uh, and there were not too many books but at least they had that uh, uh, looking at one of the trends of uh, sharing economy they uh, they initiated uh, uh, a project uh, uh, two years ago called uh, a library of things so in in, in addition to low lending books you can actually uh, get also equipment. So you can get sporting equipment, you can get uh, 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 
drawing equipment, you can get uh, a musician, uh, musical instruments. That's also a service that you can get from Tallinn Central Library. Mo mobility is important. So uh, Tallinn, Tech, uh, Tallinn Central Library was one that had a library bus uh, for kids. It goes around uh, the city every day. Uh, they have the stops, uh, they are, it's known, and so people can go and, and get the books and services uh, uh, in a mobile uh, way. And many, many, many other ways, okay? So you have a team, you have already preparatory uh, 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 tools uh, that you could use, and you have, a, you have a, 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 this agile mindset. Then comes the crisis. On, 90, on 80, uh, 13th of March, government lockdown, museums closed. Some of the libraries have not been heard since. Some of them have been closed now for two and a half months and nothing has been heard from them. Some of them, it took two months, one month to start opening, giving uh, books uh, uh, through, I don't know, a mailbox or something like that. Tallinn uh, Central Library was able to come out with the first set of new services on 23rd of um, uh, uh, March. So, uh, sorry, 20, 20th of March. So, 13th of March, government lockdown, 20th of March, first uh, services. What did they do? Quickly, they opened up the entire ebook system for everyone in Estonia for free. Secondly, they immediately signed uh, a number of new deals to increase the, imp uh, the, uh, the selection of ebooks in the system. Thirdly, they immediately started a crowdfunding uh, 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 campaign to actually for people to pay themselves in order to get more books in the system. Fourthly, they immediately launched five days after the crisis lockdown, they launched the Skype. Uh, elderly Skype rooms. So Skype uh, through Skype, uh, pensioners could actually participate in those uh, 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 um, discussion rooms uh, about books, uh, just to alleviate some of the loneliness that now when they are in lockdown. Fourthly, the very first digital service they have is actually uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, reading out uh, 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 fairy tales to children through a messenger and a phone. Fifthly, they used the library bus to actually start taking the, uh, the mobile, uh, uh, mobile locations for uh, giving and getting books. Seventhly, sixthly, seventhly, they started to send books uh, via courier, uh, courier which, is, which was not the previously the service. What can we see? We can see that while the, the library is still closed, in a sense that people cannot physically go in the library, and naturally the number of users have dropped, naturally. But what we can see is that the, the number of digital service users have now increased more than 20 times. The number of, uh, of loans in the e-book system have increased in one month 14 times. Okay, we talk about thousands and thousands of new registered users of that system. It's not about money because it's they, they don't earn extra money on this, it's about mission, it's about being relevant in times when people need information more than ever, when people have time to read more than ever, when people are uncertain to actually go and buy books themselves. So now they at least are doing everything possible to offer these services. Now, why I'm telling this? Because the, the success, if you can call it a success, the success of Tallinn Library is not in what they started to think about on the 13th of March, or the day of lockdown. It's not that. It's that what they've done several years before that. For them, it was a natural thing to do. But if you didn't think about it, if you were not prepared, if you did not understand this kind of things, you didn't, you didn't, you, you are completely taken by surprise. When we worked with the libraries in, in, for those trends, for example, one of the things that people tend to do, especially with SWOT, I don't like SWOT. 
It's what I've always said is the worst uh, uh, situation analysis tool in the world. SWOT is bad tool. Now, SWOT is excellent tool when you have done your uh, analysis and you want to uh, present your, the results. That's good. Use SWOT. But to do it, it's bad. You are much better tools. Why am I mentioning this? One of the things that SWOT makes you to do, threats and opportunities, is to think of a trend in terms of something being positive or negative. Well, of course, coronavirus is a negative trend without, you know, but you shouldn't think about trends as positive or negative. It's not up to you. It's not, it's not important what you think about it. You should think about trends as something that happens. And now it is up to you whether you capitalize on this. So turning it into your advantage or you miss the opportunity, meaning it's, it's wasted opportunity. For example, why I'm mentioning this is exactly the example of Stalin City Library and, and those trends. So aging society, aging population, demographic change. It's always written in the negatives, threats. People are getting older. Why? Why? If you're library, why? We, on the opposite, we know that the older people read more. So isn't that the older and they have more time? Isn't that the, the aging population for society, uh, for, for library is actually a good thing? Just as a, no, it's not, I mean, it's just a provocation. But if you take it as it is, I mean, it is happening. So it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. Then you ask yourself, so if there is going to be more and more and more uh, 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 older people in society, what can we do to capitalize on that? What should we do differently? And one of the things they come up with was to, meet, to, link, uh, to link digital technologies and aging society. Now, you are right to say maybe, maybe the... The, the older people are not, uh, they don't have the most up-to-date uh, uh, iPads. Uh, maybe they're not uh, very good at uh, reading e-books. You're right. I mean, yes. So how can we still offer using technology something relevant for the uh, older population? Then that's when they thought of these Skype sessions, something very simple, something very easy that you can do. Or that is why, for example, they thought of these uh, even rooms where you can actually join through your phone, call in, like uh, fairy tales, uh, fairy tale uh, uh, talk. And, and that is why, and, and all of that thinking came much before the crisis, not during the crisis, not the first day after the crisis, like a crisis meeting. No, you've been already thinking about this. So that would be my tool. That would be my call for you that you come here from museums and you come from galleries and dance and music and all of that, you should do this exercise yourself. You should think of this uh, yourself. Uh, if you go to the museum website, the, the, what I'm sending you later, the American uh, uh, museum uh, website, uh, the American Alliance of Music Trend Watch, then it's interesting. You can actually find there uh, three scenarios. Three scenarios. So not even, let's not even think about anymore where the world goes, but just three scenarios for this crisis. So that would be my next question. It's a rhetorical question to you. I'm not uh, uh, waiting answer. Is have you now, when the crisis have now been, you know, hitting us for two months, three months, have you now been thinking of different scenarios of coming out of this crisis? Have you done that? Have you had a low impact scenario, medium impact scenario, and high impact scenario? Yeah. If no, my man, why not? Even if you don't want to do scenarios in, in where my world is going in terms of climate and world of technology and all that, that's very practical. We work with our museums. In museums that we work with, they, they, it is not just the scenario building, but that's also equipped with, for example, uh, budgetary, uh, budgetary uh, 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 prognosis. So at museums, just yesterday, we, we were discussing with the, uh, or working with that uh, uh, workshop with the uh, uh, Maritime Museum. They have three scenarios in terms of budget. You have a low impact scenario. Things are getting normal quite quickly, and, uh, and uh, lockdown uh, is eased, and, uh, and uh, tourism is coming back, and all of that. 
medium impact and low impact, uh, low, uh, and, the, and, the, and the high impact. What will you do as a museum? What will you do as a, as a, as a gallery if the tourism will not go back uh, as it was uh, for years and years to come? What will happen? Naturally, you need to focus your activities more internally. Naturally, but how? Why? What, what, what is the new value proposition? Um, you need to know this. Lufthansa, Lufthansa has predicted that the, uh, the, we will see, if everything goes well, we will see the levels of tourism and travel as we saw in the beginning of the year, only in 2024. And when Lufthansa said 2024, then uh, most of people in the industry said they are optimists. So, I don't know. So again, we do not predict. It's not about making a plan if world is collapsing in 2024. It's knowing that you have a plan if everything is normal by, by September. You have a plan if everything is normal 2021 November. It, you have a plan if it's not going to be normal anytime soon. And you have those scenarios in place. Uh, uh, you have, uh, you think of what if then you come up with new services, etc. Et so these are the kind of things I want to uh, want to talk about. Um, we have uh, just one more hour. Uh, I've been talking quite a lot. Um, the second part that I want to talk about uh, is resilience. Uh, as, since I do my PhD in organizational management, uh, that's something that comes from the organizational theory itself. What makes organization resilient? Uh, uh, and, and how this is uh, linked with uh, uh, change management. How can we do changes? You know, some of you, that uh, museums, libraries, uh, universities can be very difficult to change. They are very, very inert. You know, there's a big inertia. Um, uh, and that is, by the way, by the way, this is why doing changes now is excellent. Because if everything around you is radically changing, now it's a time. If you want to change something radically, the radical time gives you that uh, time, uh, opportunity. Uh, but we are going to talk about that. But before we do, uh, I would like you uh, uh, to, share, uh, to divide you uh, between three groups. Uh, so I would ask the help. So three breakup rooms. I would like to give you 10 minutes, uh, 20, 12, 12 minutes, so uh, we'll see uh, how it goes. And I would like you uh, to go back to your own organizations, just to share a little bit of experience. And I would like each group to, uh, uh, to do two things. Firstly, I would like you to think about, do you know anyone in your group that you, you know everybody is, talks about that they are winners and losers? in that every crisis. Most of us as losers, some of the winners, Netflix is a winner, all of that. I mean, I'm not interested in Netflix. I'm not interested in Zoom. Zoom is a big winner. I'm interested in, do you know who in, in your countries, in the culture creative sectors, actually can win out of this crisis? Okay, so that's the first question. Who wins, yeah? And the second thing connected with the first one is that what do you think your organizations could implement today? Maybe one or two things that you've done differently that you haven't tried before that might help you to get out of the crisis better and stronger, okay? So who wins and what, what precisely could you do in your organizations that would help you to go out of the crisis in a better position. So 12, 12 minutes to discuss, and then we come back, okay? See you in 12 minutes. We do an automatic, uh, automatic uh, group. So can we ask the host to, Divide everybody to three groups.
Yes, yes, we can hear you. So I would like to hear from you now. Uh, three groups, um, just some thoughts, some uh, some ideas. Uh, who who uh, volunteers? Who wants to be first? What did you discuss? Group number one, maybe. I think you you can uh, open your own microphone. So, Damta. Um, yes, uh, our group selected uh, Nana Davidze to be this spokesperson, so I okay. will ask her to present some ideas Nana. that we have worked on. Yes, hi. Uh, so I am a new new member of your brilliant group, so it's a, it's a very nice experience today. I'm sitting in Poti. Uh, this is the city on the Black Sea. And uh, I send you the nice weather with the small rain. <laughs> okay. uh, to be short, to be short. So the answer from the first question is that our group discussed, and uh, uh, at the end uh, we find that the online system, I mean online experience during this virus period and, and after that, is the win situation for the uh, businesses. It includes uh, all uh, direction. I mean, it includes education system, it includes uh, businesses, tourism, uh, lectures for the students, lectures for the uh, school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the answer is the uh, online uh, uh, system experience. Online businesses. Online yeah. businesses, yeah. The, this is first. And the, for second, uh, um, also we are from different, uh, uh, <clears throat> different parts of uh, <laughs> Georgian, let's say, society. And uh, we find, um, uh, we find uh, one, uh, one answer. So uh, I am organizer on the festival. This is Fe Kefal Festival, which I want to, uh, to do here in Poti. And this festival is a tourism. One task is to develop the culture of family rest, let's say. And the second reason is to bring here, to invite here tourists, because Poti is not well known as a tourist zone today. So this festival, uh, uh, the date was 15 of August this year. And unfortunately, because of the virus, we could not prepare as well as we wanted. And a couple uh, months, a couple of weeks ago, we uh, decided to change the format. And now we want to do the first online festival in Georgia. <laughs> so the answer is um, so we change it. Nice. Okay. So I do not uh, tell you details about what we want to do, but the idea, the main idea is to uh, go to the online, um, uh, using online system for the festival. So our uh, participant will be all over the world. I mean, in Georgia and the tourists and uh, uh, from another countries, and they will sit in front of the <laughs> screens and, uh, look from the seven o'clock on the morning till the 20, uh, 10 o'clock of the evening, the, um, what we wanted to do uh, in, uh, uh, in the territory, in real territory. A question for Nana. Uh, can you please also uh, tell the dates of this festival? Uh, interesting. What, what, what were the dates? Please, please. The question was, what was the date of the, the festival? Date was, the date was 15, 1, 5, 5, 15 of August. We wanted to do it, 15 of August. But now, and, but the digital one? Uh, the same. We want to same. say the same date. August. Yeah, we want to do it okay. the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. very and good. May I ask one more question? Will you please share some links about this? Uh, um, Maybe you have a Facebook page. To it. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, I will do it. Uh, today we have the Facebook uh, page. It's uh, starting with the Georgian Kefal Fest slash Kefal Fest in English slash Festival Kefali in Russian. So, just share it in the chat. 
I will I will uh, share with you. Uh, okay. And we we try to have the three languages using three languages in this Facebook because we have three. Yes, we can uh, we can uh, share the links also here in the chat so you can write it in the uh, chat. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you, uh, Nana. Let's go to the second group. Anyone? I think uh, that people were not aware about which group doesn't they matter who, just uh, yeah. you can be whatever group. You can call yourself, everybody can be a second group. I'm very patient, you know. Okay. Can I, can I represent yes. the second group? Hi, everyone. Yes, um, well, we have this, we, in our group, there were um, members from Armenia and Georgia, and we talked about who are the winners in this situation and in the pandemic, and um, we named a few fields and sectors uh, that were able to switch to either online platforms, and these were mainly some businesses that were able to sell their product online and not stop from their, uh, not stop their work, but switch to online platforms such as bookstores and some clothing stores or some businesses that can sell their product online. So these were some of the winners. Uh, we also named fitness and healthy lifestyle um, companies that were also winners and because they were able to adjust their services to the needs of people who are at homes now i think those these are not the fields that represent creative and cultural industries uh, overall but these are the ones that we um, named that were winners and also some of those for example festivals um, like photography festival or other kind of festivals that gave people access to online platforms where people did not have to physically attend the event so these were the winners um, and as for our future plans and um, how we can become winners on or what we can do during this situation because we represent um, different organizations or our freelancers we talked about different options but we um, we kind of uh, said that uh, having a strategy within the region and having a strategy within the countries and working on creating those strategies would be very effective and successful for future so as for now um, most of us named the kind of approaches that would be that would be effective going to going to online so those those of us who were not ready to create some uh, online events will be working on that in future or switching to tourism or um, different kinds of fields where we can uh, bring in new services so mainly I think I covered the topics that we discussed in, in the group but if anyone else wants to add well, Madloba, Madloba. <laughs> Yeah. Lana? Add, uh, to, yes, I was in the same group with Tamara presented right now. And I will just <coughs> add from the point of museum to the presented museum field. Uh, also, I cannot say that museums um, we are not successful. So during the pandemic, quite um, quick, they started to, um, let's say, produce the online content. And what was, uh, I wanted to describe what kind of content was it and uh, how it went it really went quite well i can say but uh the main challenge also was uh, during the pandemic for the museums actually uh it was that they really <clears throat> got the importance of the audience they really understand because museum without audience and without uh, visitors it's a kind of dead body so pandemic went everybody is locked down working remotely so museums are closed Museums lost because they had to they had to prepare something to keep the audience actually, which they have had before the pandemic and continue to um, to keep the uh, contact with this audience and also to gain to attract the new audience. So this was really let's say good challenge for the museums as well, the pandemic situation. We come back to we we'll come back to this as well. So very good point. Do we have from third group anyone? Now you know that you were the third group. Uh, 
I can present the, the third, third group. So um, in our group, we had uh, two small museums, uh, one from Georgia, the Silk Museum, which I am uh, from that museum, and also uh, one from Azerbaijan, and also one uh, private uh, art gallery. Um, uh, so we discussed um, about the winners uh, in this situation and um, we thought that uh, in cultural sector we can't say that uh, someone is a winner of course uh, um, all the cultural institutions try to adapt to the situation and to get some advantages from it uh, but it's not that we are the winners and we are very happy that it happened uh, but uh, of course uh, all of us said that uh, um, we uh, tried to be more um, active in social media and we started using some of the platforms that we didn't use before or, or used very rarely so it's um, it gave us more time to um, do some online stuff we did that we did not have uh, when we were um, physically in the museum uh, and um, so uh, this is what we will uh, get after this pandemic uh, for example our museum will very soon launch our blog with we, which we wanted to do for a long time but we never had time to do it uh, and also some other platforms that, that we use um, and um, also there was a question um, if we uh, do uh, lots of things online uh, does not it threaten that people won't be interested to come physically to the museum but of course uh, we don't agree to this uh, we think that uh, even if we put all our um, collections online and we do virtual tours uh, the people still want to come and see the physical museum and uh, it even gives us more audience and uh, it's not a threat that we won't have physical contact with them uh, well, um, I was uh, in the first group, but um, I'm the only one who represents the higher educational university. And just I wanted to say that the winner in this situation uh, are the universities because it's always very difficult to push Georgian universities to immediate progress. And this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, it stressed universities this way that uh, even Tbilisi State Academy of Fine Art, which is, which is not such a dynamic university and uh, institution um, in reality, uh, even our institution gave an immediate reaction and we had a, a good strategy to survive. In two weeks, we have uh, changed and converted our um, learning process from uh, live regime to online regime and now we are working online and our library starts to work much better we also feel that we are much more controlling the students and the lecture process because we are archiving every lecture we are uh, recording lectures online so it really really stressed us in a positive way so we already have done a lot of things uh, in this direction thank you very good thank you all um this was a uh, this was a provocative and also um, tricky question uh, winners um, those that seem to be winners short term might not be winners in long term um, for example somebody mentioned uh, maybe bookstores or, or library or um, uh, publishers uh, uh, you could be short a winner if you can quickly come to the market with a new service, but you're going to lose. You are going to be loser because a long-term, short or medium or long-term economic crisis will, one of the first impacts on the people buy less books. So even if you quickly, uh, or another thing, for example, if, uh, if you, uh, uh, um, for museums uh, especially we've the, the the question of uh, digital uh, content now this has been incredible across the world i don't know every country but but you know and lana mentioned i might i might uh, over exaggerate here but but uh, uh, in terms of libraries we've seen more digital transformation in the past two months than the past 10 years in terms of the amount of digital content. And I work with them every day with museums. It's not just that they didn't 
have that before and now they have. No, they were quite reluctant to do this. Many of them didn't see the added value of this. So it is kind of a mindset difference. Now, the, the amount of uh, home concerts, streaming concerts, the amount of these this, this very quickly done things, fantastic. But on the other hand, if you now analyze how much of this is being included in the business model of those organizations, or operating model, if you don't like the word business model, zero, often, zero. It is more of a cost, 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 cost. Very little, actually, profit side of things. So if that's the case, then on one hand, it's not bad. Because if you look at the brand building side of things, then in building brand and building communication with your audience, one of the critical tools is trust. So if you show as an organization that you are there in the difficult time for your audience, then you actually invest in the long-term relationship with your, uh, with your audience. So it's even if it's zero, even if you... Um, put more money that it comes back, that's fine, that's fine. But if that is a long-term thing, if that doesn't actually bring any added value in short, medium or long-term, you're gonna be, I mean, that, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. The same thing with quality. If uh, second week of a uh, lockdown, uh, somebody comes up with a, a, a music, a home music streaming concert, and actually, it was so novel, it was so new. I went to quite many of them. And, I, and it was always opportunity. It was for free, but you could uh, uh, voluntarily give them money. Actually, they earned more money than with a concert. Because suddenly, for example, one of the concerts who usually get maybe 200 people in the room, 300 people in the room, he had 15,000 people watching. 15,000 people. He was one of the first ones to do this. And you could give money. You could give one euro, two euro, five euro, 10 euro, seven, 17 euro, whatever. And people gave. So he actually earned three, I think it was three times more money with, with than with the usual one. But because he was fast, because he was first one. If you now look at two months later, if you tell me another online home concert, with bad quality, with microphone that, that doesn't work, with lighting, with and asking me more and more money. I mean, doesn't work anymore. So even within that kind of a, I mean, first museum that came out with a digital tour, we all went to look, see it. But now if it's a 17th museum saying that come to the virtual tour, I mean, uh, I, there's a limit somewhere, yeah? So, uh, also so, let, oh, sorry. Tell so, please. If there was also, in terms of virtual tools, there was also good point from the Google actually that we had this big, big visiting of virtual tours, uh, in, I think in the beginning of March, and the statistic went down because the people uh, um, not lost the interest, but uh, it was just low uh, statistic to visit yes. these virtual tours. Naturally, and, and, and that's what we have to think about when we think about the kind of a long-term strategy here on the digital transformation. I think, and this is something that I believe personally, I, there, there's no study on this. I think that the, when it comes to communication, the world will be uh, different. At least I hope so. Uh, one thing that I think the world has shown us now is that what can be done digitally should be done digitally. I think that the waste of money, waste of time and waste of resources on traveling together and meeting just for informational purpose is over. At least I hope it's over. I'm afraid it's not, but I hope it is. Now, but it doesn't mean that the need for face-to-face -face interaction has gone. No, it's just that when we meet in the future, that should be uh, used so much better way. We need to meet because we need to discuss, we need to argue, we need to debate, we need to co-create something. That is something you can do face to face. That is some, and for example, I'm a part of, the, of my university senate uh, and, and we have this higher, some mentioned higher education impact. Absolutely. 
there's a big discussion of how much of what has been working relatively well now during the lockdown with online, uh, online courses, how much would that need to go back to the physical? And actually the discussion is that not everything should go to physical just because we are now open. Because for some, for informational part, just, you know, I give you passively information. This can be easily done through video. You choose your own uh, pace, you choose your own time. But, you know, practical side of things and, and seminar side of things needs to be there. So I think that will change. And, and, and also in terms of museums, uh, I don't think that it was right that museums had so little digital content that supported their physical. But it's not that the, that the digital should replace the physical. It should inspire us. It should teach us more. Uh, and it should inspire us go to the museum yeah? and maybe interact in the museum differently. So I think there is a need to look at this digital transformation in a different way. Since I have 10 minutes left and, 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 uh, and we still have a few questions uh, I can take, let me just start concluding by saying organizational resilience. I'm going to send you the materials. But organizational resilience, which, you know, resilience means that we can, we, we, if, you, if you bend us like a crisis bends us, we don't crack. That's resilience. Yeah? Uh, then according to the British Standard Institution, the organization of resilience, I might just uh, quote here, is the ability of organization to anticipate, so that is what we discussed before, to, to forecast, yeah? to anticipate, to prepare for, that means to make a plan, to respond and adapt to incremental change or radical or sudden disruption, to survive and to prosper. And now let's look at our, our organizations like this. Now, in the organizational resilience, which is a bigger topic and something for, uh, for maybe uh, 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 in the future, but basically in organization resilience, you have two driving forces. So we as organization, we as people, we have two driving forces during the crisis. One is defensive. How to stop bad things happen? Okay, and second is progressive, how to make good things. Now, in organizational resilience, you need both, and it actually goes over time. It depends on the impact of the crisis. It depends on, uh, on the, how long it lasts. But these are the forces that are, and, and the other kind of forces on the other axis is flexibility and continuity, meaning on one hand, in times of crisis, we need we need systems, we need agreements, we need reserves, we need plans, we need, we need structures and, 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 and this kind of what gives us consistency. But at the same time, to come out of this, we need flexibility, we need to be able to test and fail. And so how to link that consistency with flexibility in times when we both need to be defensive, but also to be, uh, uh, to be progressive. Usually it starts by defensive mechanisms. I will share quickly my, uh, uh, my uh, um, screen as well, so you can see what I mean uh, in this uh, uh, model. But usually, uh, if I put this one here, uh, usually we start by, lo let's lo look at the lower level of the uh, graph on the defensive side. And we, we have on one hand this kind of a preventative control, Okay, so we have monitoring, complying, we have systems, and we have mindful action. So we try to notice around us the trends and you know, what's happening and how it changes us, and then respond to this just to, to prevent something bad happening to us. Ideally, we should be collecting uh, reserves, money to overcome whatever comes with us. Now, the main focus in defensive side is loss avoidance. So we want to avoid big losses and also preserve, uh, uh, preserve, preserve the value that we have. Basically, if I'm, if I'm, it's not bad, I mean, everyone goes through these phases, but basically what I mean is that when the crisis comes, you like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, take the big breath <gasps> and hope that it goes over, okay? 
And the idea here is by resilience that we want to bounce back. Let's hope that the crisis goes over and we bounce back and life is as it was. Now, with some crises it might be, with some problems it might be, with others it might never be the same. I don't know about this crisis, it more looks like it will have long-term impacts. Then, if you understand that, then we look at the upper side of the model. Uh, clearly, it became soon recognized in organization resilience that it was not just about bouncing back, but bouncing forward. Okay, so basically ability to prosper in a long term. So basically meaning that if I, my, my main focus is to remain as I was before the crisis. Okay, I want to remain as much as I was before the crisis. And then you put this old organization that worked very well before the crisis. You put this in a new world where everything around you is different. You're going to fail. So if everything around you changes, you need to change as well. For example, simple museum, just as an example, or, or festivals you mentioned. If your model worked brilliantly with serving tourists and the crisis is over, you go back, but the tourism sector changes, then your model that serves tourism doesn't work. So you don't need an old organization, you need a new organization. And then we look at the progressive, we look at the performance optimization. So on one hand, we need to do smaller changes in improving the way we worked before. But also we need adaptive innovation. We need to start creating completely new ways of thinking about the organization. In other words, we need to be innovative. By the way, it's a paradox. Why? Because by being adaptively innovative, we change the environment by doing that ourselves. Yeah? So if we create new reality, that, re that changes the environment as well. So we are not just reacting to the environment, we're changing the environment, okay? So that's basically the, the concept. I can, uh, uh, I'm happy to share uh, more of that with you and the links if you're interested. But, uh, the change can be either incremental, as I mentioned, or radical, step by step, or radical. Now we see a radical change. That means that we need radical action as well. We know, all of you know something, that we know that making changes in any organization is terribly, terribly difficult. On one hand, it's easier now than ever before. Yes, we don't have enough money, but at least we have less resistance. People are not, oh, but, you know, uh, change is bad and changing for the sake of change. No, no, no. If everything is, is bad, then we need to come up with something new. Uh, I, I recommend to look at the uh, Kurt Levin uh, uh, change uh, uh, model. Uh, again, I'm sending you a link, which is basically three phases. It's unfreezing the situation. And if you don't unfreeze situation, people are always resisting then it's date, date, making the changes and then freezing it, meaning that you need to get those changes into organizational culture, in the DNA of your organization. Usually, the uh, unfreezing is very difficult to make it clear for the organization that change is needed. Now it is easy. Everybody, I, I hope so, at least people are much more uh, understandable that change is needed. Another Levin's very good point, that a tool that we use is a force, a, a change force, force field analysis, force field analogy. So you look at, you have a change that you need to get and you have uh, uh, supporting uh, forces. What support the change and what is against the change? And even if you list the changes, both those that are in, in favor and those that are against, and if you put even the numbers like one to five, you can even look at the force field saying, listen, I have a very positive moment at the moment to make those changes because there are more supporting forces than those that are against. Now we go also to another thing. We discussed the strategy, but what we have been discussing with museums and libraries and organizations in the culture sector is that there is much more need 
of thinking about what you do in the value proposition point of view. I don't know how much of you have been dealing with value proposition canvas or the business model canvas, but this is the tool that we, we use not just for business. Again, if you use business model canvas, it's not about becoming a business. It is simply giving you extreme, even, I mean, uh, higher education, my university looks at its, its programs through business model canvas. It is answering what is the value you give to your customer, what needs do you, uh, uh, what needs do you uh, 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 service, and how you, uh, 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 how you earn money on this. But why I'm bringing you this in now is because these are usually the uh, known parts of the value proposition, meaning the need and the customer and segment and what I offer and what it costs and what, you know. But then there are ways in the between of channels. How do I get my service or my value to my customer? How? For example, even if it doesn't, if you're a museum and your customer is a, you know, person that is interested in history and my proposition is a knowledge that I share, that is not changed even during the crisis. But the channels are completely changed. The way or the customer relations are completely changed. So it's not, it's not anymore the way that the only way for your loving customer to, to get your uh, services to come to your place. Now it's not possible. So what's the other way? What's the other alternative? We've seen some critically uh, 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 problematic uh, mistakes uh, uh, across Europe. We've seen, for example, where museums, the first thing that museums cut in, some of the museums cut in, uh, during the crisis, were educational services. Because, you know, Library, uh, the, the children's schools were closed and schools could not come to that. Isn't that stupid? I mean, if that is the core mission of a museum, and now, especially, especially now in these times of social dis distancing, when we need to give that knowledge to, uh, through different programs, you cut something that is mi in mission terms the most critical. So, you know, this is the when we need to realign our mission, our strategy, and our value proposition with this uh, new reality. And finally, I want to tell you that this crisis has clearly brought uh, the importance on agility. This is usually when we talk about startups. You know, we talk about innovation management, agility, lean startup, and all of that. No, this has been my, my passion. Le uh, Lana knows this. I've written also to Nemo, uh, uh, Nemo's uh, book about, since my, my background now is uh, organizational studies, and I want to link it with museums and libraries, heritage institutions. My main idea is that any culture organization could win quite a lot if they would use the tools that startups and businesses use without necessarily becoming more commercial or business. So, Lean startup. The, the, what I was telling you about the uh, Italian uh, uh, Central Library, the fact that the director has basically created a, uh, a, a the innovative development team, which is in that uh, uh, in a startup uh, logic, it's called it's a Scrum. I don't know if you heard of it. Scrum. It takes place in uh, in uh, in IT companies where in IT development software iteration you have this small independent teams, yeah, scrum teams. Uh, uh, they, they don't call it that way. It's, they don't even know about this. But if you look at what they do, that's an agile mechanism. What is allowed to them? If you were a museum or music organization or, or a gallery, and you were doing pretty well with tourism booming and you had lots of visitors, you might have inhibited to try out something new. Why? Because you didn't want to risk it. You know, things work. Why should, maybe I do something and you know, audiences will not accept it. Now is a fantastic time to try these things out. You have nothing to lose. You, you could try, you can try every week something new. Now we go to the design thinking principles, design management. You test it out. You try out half, you know, prototyping. Prototyping now, if you're a cultural organization or a university, in small scale, online, getting feedback is brilliant now. 
something that you were not really allowed to do during the time. So basically, my summary of this is that who is a winner? No, I don't know. It's too short to say. Maybe you call winner who was able to first come up with a service, maybe somebody who did a better service, somebody who comes out of it stronger. I don't know. But I know that in order to be winner, even theoretically, you need to be three things today. One thing, you need to be learning organization. That's entire an, another concept, but meaning an organization where you knowingly develop the skills and competences of your people. It's absolutely pointless to talk about now digital transformation, radical digital transformation in your organization if you don't have people that can do this. Okay? So if you do not nurture certain skills and competences in a long term, you, you're screwed basically. Okay? Secondly, you need to be resilient organization. Okay? That means, as I mentioned, you not only have defensive forces to kind of protect yourself, but it is about inno innovative. You basically look at new opportunities, new opportunities that, new avenues of, of value creation. And they don't have to replace what you do. They shouldn't, I think, but they add value. They build long-term relationship with your customers. And thirdly, you need to be agile organization. Agile, prototyping, testing, experimenting, failing, failing. If you should even have a metric. If your organization, if you, if your people have not failed in the past one month, five times, they have not tried. They have not tried anything. They only played safe. They only played safe. So think about, push yourself. If you do a first uh, online uh, festival, uh, uh, in uh, in pot in kefal kefal festival go beyond that world is full of online festivals already go beyond that think of even new ways i bring you the last example and then i close just yesterday got back from the open air museum one of the best one of the most beautiful places in Tallinn, and one of the key events every year something that they get ten thousand people uh, visiting is uh, 23rd of june the most important day in our part of the world, and that's the midsummer. So midsummer night, everybody goes out, everybody has bonfires, their families and their communities come together, and we celebrate. This is even more important than Christmas. Okay, this is the most important day of the year. And for museums, they earn a lot of money because tens of thousands of people come and this is the biggest and most beautiful bonfire and not just bonfire because that museum tells you about how in thousands of years people have done those bonfires and what are the customs and traditions around it. They can't do this anymore. So what can they do? They can have small because we have a limit in our, we're limited with thousand people. So in Estonia, only thousand people can come uh, uh, from 1st of June together outside. So could you have thousand people's event? Well, you could, but you know, organizational costs are more than just 1000 uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, so that's not, what, what can you do? And you have a mission, by the way, not just money, your mission. You want to get the mission out of the, the knowledge, the information uh, about traditions and you know, what can you do? So what they do, they, they uh, deemed up with the biggest Estonian newspaper. And they have, as you said uh, before, the first uh, online uh, festival in, in Georgia, they're going to have the first ever digital midsummer uh, bonfire. Meaning that in history, bonfires were about family and small communities. So they go back to basics. They are now mapping every family, every village, everyone can link up their uh, bonfire locally to the big database. And suddenly, and they in the months to come, they talk about traditions and they share. And that evening, basically, instead of having one uh, bonfire, you will have probably tens of thousands of bonfires and even physically with videos, with, with Zooms, with everything coming together as a big Estonian bonfire. Now, money-wise, well, they, got, they get a lot of uh, uh, 
marketing out of this. Yes, they lose. They lose 10,000 people's uh, uh, ticket price. Yes, they lose it. But in terms of mission, I am absolutely certain that because of that, many, many, many times more people know about the museum and their activities than just with 10,000 people on their lawn. So again, agile organizations where people are pushed for new thinking, resilient organizations, not the defensive, but also creating new reality and learning organizations with people with new skills. So these are the kind of things I wanted to cover. There would be so much more, but you know, we have time. We've gone over the time already. Uh, I, uh, I can still get a few questions if you want. For those that need to leave, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, leave. Uh, but maybe you have a few questions that you want to ask immediately. We can do this as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. This uh, was an excellent um, uh, webinar, one of the best ones I have ever participated during these two months. And uh, just uh, uh, I would like to add to this last idea of uh, the festival in uh, Tallinn. It's a great idea, something what I, I want also to initiate in Armenia. Um, you said that maybe they are losing financially, but uh, they are winning in terms of uh, communicating the mission. Um, I think if they find uh, ways of um, uh, motivating um, to partner some producers of um, different products who will, who will have some common um, ideological link to the festival, and promote uh, online sales. So this can bring also commercial uh, interest to this festival. What do you think? Absolutely. What I meant, meant was exactly that maybe short term, you feel like you lose, but actually you can win. There's actually a good experience with that, that precise museum. That museum gets 150,000 visitors per year. Uh, that was the plan for this year, 150,000. Then the crisis hit, everything is closed. Uh, and uh, they did, as I mentioned, scenarios. They did scenarios. They even did the scenarios based on the action plan and financing. They did a, a positive, negative, uh, dreadful, three different uh, uh, plans. And the worst plan that they worked with, and that is the worst plan financially they worked with, uh, foresaw that instead of uh, instead of 150,000 people, they will get, uh, uh, they will get uh, uh, 20,000, meaning they already had 5,000 in the first uh, uh, month. Now it's nothing and the rest will be just, uh, I think, with 17,000 people. I said, well, this is way too uh, uh, pessimistic. I mean, this, I mean, this is really, but they said, but listen, we don't know if there's a second wave. We don't know if the tourism, there's any tourism. We don't know this and that. So we did everything. So they had everything planned in terms of budget, uh, salaries, everything with just 20,000 people instead of 150. They opened it. Uh, they opened the museum uh, uh, two weeks ago now. Um, and uh, the one week they were open, one week, they are slightly different because they are the open air museum. So instead, in addition to the buildings, they also have a lot of you know, beautiful uh, uh, um, area. Uh, but in one week only, uh, because of the social media uh, presence and everything, they got, and I'm not lying, not more, not less, they got 4,000 visitors one week. Yes, it, it might have been like people were so tired of being at home and you know, the, the, but 4,000. So you see how, how uh, naturally they shouldn't be working with the uh, darkest uh, scenario anymore. But at least they were ready for this. They had all the plans to do. And one, uh, an, an example, uh, example of this, that museum has a training center and they train uh, uh, people who own uh, uh, old uh, farmhouses or you know old heritage buildings they teach them how to sustainably 
care for the building, like how to put roofs or how to make uh, uh, windows or, or, or uh, renovate stairs and all of that. And th we discussed entire last year, how can we take the uh, training program to the new level? And they were not really, I mean, they were, they were kind of stuck. They were really stuck. I mean, they, they usually have, uh, every year they have uh, 800 to 1,000 people going through all the programs they have. It's usually one time, we, you know, all of these kind of issues. Now, uh, the, uh, the crisis hit. And what they did was they closed everything down in the big. First two months, nothing, zero. We can't do anything. Uh, and we were pushing, saying, listen, uh, and with the director, like, let's, let's think out of the box. I mean, I understand you cannot organize physically, but maybe we can do something online, you know? Finally, they changed the person. They got a new person. Uh, in two weeks, they organized the first uh, online training for renovating, sustainable renovation. And you, can imagine, you can't imagine what happened. One event, uh, uh, what happened one day, uh, 600 people from 11 countries. Now, I'm not saying that all 600 people watched everything from the beginning to the end, but with the usual way of doing things, you will never, ever be able to get 600 even people to think about clicking a link. Again, what we're saying is that you always need a physical part there. You need to come and practice. But that can be addition to the uh, video lecture. You get the first information there, you come there, and you can already do much more in a practical way. So again, sometimes even if you're not open yourself, the world pushes you over the edge. Think you, you have to, you don't have an option. And that's why I'm saying we need to, that's, that's the defensive versus the progressive way. If we are defensively thinking, it's very much like, let's try to keep everything we worked so hard in the past. And progressively means, listen, since uh, there's nothing to lose, let's do something that we otherwise would even hate, but let's try. Any other question we can get? If I can. Yes, Um Well, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting um, session and all the topics you've covered. Um, I think for most of us uh, and for a lot of people in creative industries, this pandemic has been like someone pushing us into the swimming pool where we are forced to uh, learn how to swim. So in this sense, Tallinn City, uh, Tallinn City Library was a perfect example of why and how we should be kind of prepared for this kind of situation. So um, thank you for sharing all the points that uh, and all the actions that they have uh, taken during this uh, pandemic. It's very good to know and analyze. But also uh, what I wanted to point out is that um, Tam Tam mentioned, for example, that uh, the education sector was pushed to um, have this immediate progress. Um, Salome also from the museum, she said that they were forced to now start the online um, the online uh, museum that they were planning for a long time. So there have definitely been um, positive outcomes out of this situation, but there are still a lot of organizations, companies that have, that simply either have not um, survived or will not be surviving in the upcoming months and will kind of see the results um, sooner or later. So uh, I think I won't be exaggerating if I say that the, the government in this sense have kind of failed us to provide services, to switch to the online services, to even if they have um, been more effective in not only having a reserved fund to save the culture sector, but also just in any sense give us kind of training trainings, consultations, or help us switch to the new platforms, that will be very helpful. So we were kind of left on our own, and those who are um, strong enough will survive, and those who are not won't. So um, my question in this sense is then, can you briefly name um, any activities or services the Estonian government has uh, offered the creative industry sector during the pandemic, other than financial support or funds or just any other um, strategic 
plans because I believe that um, we as organizations were not ready, but also the government had no strategy at all, no reserve funds at all. And also, if not the government, are there any other um, kind of umbrella organizations, companies that have benefited from the situation and, uh, and helped each other learn, go through uh, online platforms, go um, create new services, kind of um, become adjustable to this new situation? So. Uh, if you could share several examples, uh, yes. like Estonian side. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I deliberately avoided talking about uh, government support. Uh, as in all European Union countries, uh, there has been a very quick reaction uh, from the government side. Uh, so yes, answer is yes. There has been, for example, in Estonia, but it's, it's true in almost all EU countries, uh, 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 the government has been paying uh, for three months now, March, a April, May, June, uh, uh, salaries. So 700 euros per person. Uh, and museums get that as well. So for example, all museums, not only government, uh, who have lost uh, 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 income, uh, certain percent, uh, or impacted by the crisis, uh, get uh, uh, a salary supplement. It's called salary supplement. Uh, so culture has, everybody gets that. So uh, everybody. Uh, in the cultural sector, yes, the government immediately, in a short term, uh, gave, we're a small country, one million people, as you know. So just uh, remember that when I, I use the numbers. But the government immediately gave 25 million euros uh, for culture sector. Uh, for the immediate uh, relief uh, of, so for example, in museum sector, just example, in museum sector, six million euros uh, is being divided now in the, in, in the first three months of the crisis between all museums, not only government museums, all museums to cover the uh, uh, lost income. Uh, of course, it doesn't cover everything, but at least it covers some of it. So, uh, so uh, yes, you have lots of these, uh, uh, also loans you can take, uh, you can, uh, for example, City of Tallinn immediately, uh, uh, and it's still on four, so it's, it's for four months, uh, uh, um, uh, abolished all rents on all spaces that belong to them. So everybody who is renting space for the city doesn't have to pay any rent uh, for four months, for example. So you have lots and lots and lots of these uh, uh, tools. Uh, uh, we have the Culture Foundation called Endowment, Estonia Culture Endowment, as you know, which is around uh, 30 million euros every year for culture projects. And uh, since, uh, of course, you have all these uh, flexible measures, meaning that if you used it for something that doesn't happen, you don't have to pay it back. But since there was still uh, uh, some leftovers, it was immediately given out for the artists. So musicians, uh, um, uh, writers, everybody got, uh, may maybe you got 500 euros, maybe 800, maybe 1,000 euros uh, individually um, to, to, to survive because you don't have enough money. So answer is yes, but I didn't want to focus on this. Because yes. we, can, we can always simply say that the government is failing us and we know that you have stronger governments and less strong governments and, and the environment doesn't support. But my message is uh -huh. that while your governments might be failing you in these terms, uh, there are things that individually we can all do uh, 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 within our organizations. So yes. the fact that the government doesn't give us money or it doesn't understand doesn't mean why we cannot run an organization more innovatively, for example. Yes, that, that so was the I'll, idea. But I'll just um, um, add one more thing. Uh, why, why, I, why I named these problems is that uh, my question also was what can we as uh, institutions and non-governmental organizations, how can we help those who cannot survive or switch to the modern ways and technologies immediately? What services can we provide to those who, who don't get enough um, kind of support? So that was mainly why I focused. As I, as I said, as I said, most of my or half of my message was, of course, uh, hindsight saying, you know, I told you so. Why didn't you do it before? Estonia is so much better positioned. We are the e-government. We have the e-digital solutions. You know, it's easier. There has been so much funding 
over the past 10 years to digitize, to have those platforms ready. So it's easy. By surprise, by surprise or by coincidence, uh, every year in Estonia is dedicated as a special year of something. You have a mu music year, you have museum year, you have this and that. This year, surprisingly, is a digital culture year. And <laughs> just imagine the surprise of the people behind it. It's, it's, it's coordinated, a government every year gives money and uh, selects a coordinator and it's coordinated by the uh, National uh, Library. But just imagine saying, now everything, all the culture is digital culture. So it's, it's more relevant than ever before. Estonia, got, Estonia immediately got to the CNN and global media outlets because we were the first country to organize a hack, hackathon called a global hackathon of hack the crisis. Now there are a million other hackathons coming, but it, it, it's this attitude of things. So yes, you as museums and cultural institutions, you can start hack your crisis. You can start bringing on board people that otherwise, maybe they have no time because of that. I just myself was at the uh, online hackathon for 48 hours. Very, very interesting. I was a mentor myself there. Uh, uh, um, service providers, uh, museum, uh, the Italian, uh, uh, the Estonian History Museum say, was saying that the second month of the lockdown and uh, the, one of the, uh, the best design companies like visual design and companies, turned to them and said, listen, we've done work in the past. You usually cannot afford us, but we have no work. So, I mean, uh, maybe, I mean, we can, we can do better price, but to be honest, is there something we can do for free? Because we are going crazy. So even new uh, relationship with service providers that are basically doing i mean they are doing nothing uh, i'm not saying that you should be like bully saying okay you are now down and you have no income and now do it for free but you can now collaborate as institutions with some some people that you were not you could not afford in the in the past i can take one more question because i uh, um, i have another meeting. I have Ragnar, we question. are half an can hour I... almost half an hour past our time so Ooh. yes but uh, tamta tamta Sorry, very right. quick question. I'm so desperately interested in Ragnar's position and comment about new emerged digital economy and the connection of digital economy with cultural systems. How do you see the culture in the frames of digital economy? What are the perspectives for culture and cultural sector? Thank you. And sorry, Gela, sorry and thank you. Yeah. No worries. No, no worries. Tam, uh, Tamta asked a good question, and now uh, uh, next uh, two hours, uh, um, I, I'm going to follow with the uh, uh, next <laughs> webinar called the Digital Culture: Role of Culture and Creativity in Digital Economy. So to go back to history, uh, no, <laughs> um, uh, I think that as we just discussed, the link is incredibly uh, uh, clear now. Um, but it also has brought us, uh, and, and I recommend to, to watch, uh, I've been doing interviews, uh, you probably, maybe some of you have seen it uh, uh, on Facebook with cultural experts uh, uh, in the f last few weeks. Uh, have a look at some of them, especially the one, for example, with uh, Philip Kern. Um, you can find them on my Facebook page, for example, or, or cultural policy researchers, or, or uh, you can all follow, I'm uh, also running the European, it's called Culture Policy Designers Network. Culture Policy Designers Network. So if you find the um, uh, website, uh, CPDN Culture Policy Designers Network, or um, uh, Facebook page, you find those interviews. Some of these issues, for example, the copyright issue, and the big digital uh, distribution channels, big issue. Because now we've seen the mistakes that we have made by letting uh, the distribution channels to be completely Americanized. So you have so much valuable content locally or regionally, which does not, does not get to Netflix's, Amazon's and things like that. So, 
that is a big mis mismatch. In Estonia, they quickly, the, na the public broadcaster came up with their own, which was, again, luckily worked because of the year for many years. But now they opened up uh, and there's an Estonian content. But for example, European content, very difficult to get to the European content uh, through these channels. Uh, so it's a big issue that shows the, 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 the system is, is really not uh, there yet. And that the content that and also the who gets money, because if 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 the artist somehow survive the YouTube's and Spotify's and Netflix's because they still have the live industry, okay, and they actually digital supports the live. That's where they actually earn. But if the if the live goes away zero and digital survives and you still earn nothing you earn 0 0.0000001 cent per click that's not sustainable so you see these are the kind of issues that are like oh sorry i have a anyway um that's it for me now uh you can always thank you so me, much uh, ragnar yeah. i think <laughs> I think this was uh, the first online seminar I've attended that uh, went at least half an hour just above the time, allocated time. Thank that you so shows much. the bad management yeah. skills of, the, of <laughs> me, not how good it was. It shows, it shows the interest of the audience, first and foremost. Thank you so much. <laughs> we, uh, we, did, uh, we did the webinar uh, last uh, two weeks ago, or last week. Gonieri, you remember? Uh, and yes. uh, and I uh, I said in the beginning that I with my mind with my um, um, my uh, mind waves that I want to mute Gela I want to mute Gela and what happened was <laughs> throughout the session Gela's microphone didn't work <laughs> so it was a wishful thinking that came true so today I didn't say that so I'm happy that that you can still be with Thank you, appreciate anyway, it, appreciate Take care. Thank you, Thank everyone. You Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Nagla. It was Thank always, you. always very interesting. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you Thank soon. See you soon. Thank you. Can I ask Thank much for the amazing webinar? Thank you. Thank you, Ragnar. Bye. Can I ask the organizer if the webinar is going to be shared, the recording? It was a great webinar. Thank you very much. Was interesting. Thank you. Bye. Staying very informative. Okay. Yes, the video will be shared in the Facebook uh, event. Okay. Thank you.